I work with clay all the time. I start with clay or wax, the two are both um, things that you model with and uh, add on to that. You're working with an additive process. So people say, but that doesn't look like sculpture to me, because they think that sculpture has to be carved marble, which is a different thing altogether. But sometimes uh, I, I will do something very quickly, a um, matter of hours, other times, depending on whether it's a beautiful person, and I keep doing the, or, uh, in the studio for a long time, or an interesting head, or, or so on. From his home in rural North Hertfordshire, celebrated British sculptor John Mills creates faces from clay. He often works without a photo or model, relying on an incredible memory for the contours and structure of the human face, sometimes after only the briefest of meetings. His studio is a display case for hundreds of sculptures, from great artists such as Rodin and Rembrandt to rock stars and royalty from friends and family to poets and politicians. Dear Betty is a, a, a very powerful woman. She wasn't intimidating. If anybody could intimidate, it was Betty Boothroyd. <laughs> uh, but she was charming and enjoyed the experience. And I think most people do. That's uh, Lady Sitwell. She is a formidable woman and I managed to persuade her to sit for me. And I think we fell in love together. She's just a super person. She's now in her 90s or something, still going. That was something that melded in, in, a, in a slightly different way. And she didn't really want to sit. So I said, well, come down to breakfast and we'll start her breakfast. And she sort of fell into the whole thing. And, well, I think that group there, the things that I've made to do with people that I had great um, regard for. There's Rembrandt along here, Michael Angelo there, Buster Keaton there. Uh, they were my, the heroes that helped me when I was looking for some way of, of reconciling my own need to make sculpture. And... I see Rembrandt as a way of making uh, uh, entry into my own world. But well, 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 the, the starting point, there was a book called The Techniques of Rembrandt, and there were, it was a book entirely to do with what he did in specific places. And so I used that as the base. And this really is the beginning of me finding something that was only mine. There was this, this, this myth that you can't make art from art. So I tell that to Rodin. He was copying Michelangelo, so not bad really. But, um, so I thought, no, no, that, that, that can't be true. So I took out the two-dimensional thing, made that the sculpture, and then added the back as and when the things changed in my mind. But I kept the, the origin of the, of the idea. The whole business of selecting somebody as a, as a, a subject is, again, in my point of view, something that's unnecessary because your job is to make a sculpture of anybody and anything. Um, don't select it because you, you find people looking at, oh, look at that wonderful head, look at that wonderful head. Um, what they're saying is they want to reproduce their beautiful head. But you shouldn't do The head is there for you to uh, refer to, not make your alternative to it. What one is concerned with when you're looking for the likeness is the likeness of the structure, not the moment of the thing which is on top of the structure. So if you get the hard things right, you'll get everything else right. Because they will never change. But what will change is everything else. So if you understand that, you, you know what you can do. I emphasise to myself that I'm not making a replica. I'm making an interpretation of that person 
think you have to be true to yourself um, and uh, consequently you'll be true to them. Whether they like it or not, that's a different matter. When people try to impose their memory upon you, you have to resist it because you can't model other people's memories. And that's, that's the important thing. I can't adjust it to your memory because I don't know what your memory is. I argue with myself all the time. But, but that's, that's between me and me. Um, and once it's done and, and resolved, then it's finished. It says uh, you can't do any more on this one. You have to either make another one or stop. That, that, that's, that's what the benefit is of working on, on, on your own and not being intimidated by the, the, the subject. What it would be if uh, um, somebody really important comes wrong? I don't, who would that be? I don't know. I don't think there's anybody that's grand enough to, to, to say um, I'm more important than what you're making. I don't have any, I don't have any real doubts about being able to achieve what it is I'm setting out to do. And when something, as often happens, something is, it says, no, this is not right. When it starts to tell you that, then you've got to listen, because you've done something wrong. But on the other hand, it might be something that's worked better. So you have to, you, you have to take care of yourself. I mean and be aware of, of, of what the potentials are. You can't learn that. It, it, it can only come with, with experience and doing things. When I've got something going which is a challenge, like this figure, for instance, it's, I challenge myself with this figure, and I wake up thinking about what I should be doing to it. Um, sometimes I do it before I have any breakfast or sometimes afterwards. This is a kind of challenge for me because I, I, I've set the, the target before I, I haven't drew, drawn anything, I haven't studied anything, I just thought I can do this where the whole thing is complete, fingers, toes, so it's all a complete image, all done in the same way. Um, I find that quite exciting. And if Joe comes in and says, eh, it's, a, it's rubbish, isn't it, really? I go back and think again, have another cup of coffee. <laughs>